Hi, everyone. Welcome to our channel, Channel Ed, Douglas McGregor asserts that Russia's strength is underestimated, emphasizing the unity and determination of the Russian people. Contrary to the belief that the government lacks support, McGregor highlights the patriotism and resilience of the population, suggesting that Russia should not be underestimated in its ability to defend itself and its interests against the United States and its allies. True, he acknowledges Putin as perhaps the most Western-friendly leader Russia has seen. He raises concerns about the potential challenges of dealing with a successor less inclined towards the West and less informed about Western affairs. Emphasizing Russia's long history and desire for coexistence with the West, he asserts that despite differences, their interests may not necessarily conflict, and Russia has no intention of engaging in conflicts in Eastern Europe. Regarding the potential for political shifts, he recalls past events where underestimation led to unexpected outcomes, highlighting the in the mix of repeating such mistakes. Expressing uncertainty about containing potential backlash, he warns of the repercussions if underestimated groups mobilize again. Reflecting on discussions about financial warfare and the push towards a gold-backed currency led by Putin, China, and India, he mentions Alistair MacLeod's insights. While skeptical about adopting a gold-backed approach, he sees potential in independent digital currencies like Bitcoin as a store of value, suggesting they might replace fiat currencies in the future. He positions himself between Nassim Taleb and Alastair MacLeod's perspectives, viewing Bitcoin as a potential alternative path forward. He critiques the central banking system that has prevailed in the West since the establishment of the Federal Reserve in 1913 noting historical resistance to it by past presidents and attributing it to leading causes of hostility towards Russia, he suggests that both Russia and China seek to free themselves from its influence. Reflecting on the role of central banking in previous world wars, he expresses his criticism while acknowledging the challenge of dismantling it. He believes that President Putin's emphasis on strategic interests rather than personal relationships is overlooked in the West. He argues that the United States has strayed from pursuing its own strategic interests, particularly in eastern Ukraine, and has prioritized military power over economic influence and cooperation. He critiques the portrayal of Putin in Western media and highlights Russia's message of coexistence and non-aggression towards Eastern Europe. Furthermore, he criticizes the handling of the conflict in Ukraine, suggesting that Western intervention has exacerbated the situation and led to significant human suffering. He predicts that the United States will eventually withdraw from the conflict, leaving Europe to deal with the aftermath. He proposes a negotiation approach to end the war, emphasizing the need for both parties to delineate their strategic interests and reach a compromise. He he writes out that the current leader in Russia is notably more Western-friendly compared to potential successors, emphasizing his extensive international experience and understanding of geopolitics and economics. Expressing concern that a less amicable leader could replace him. He suggests considering this factor in international dealings with Russia. Switching topics to the situation in Gaza, he highlights the transformation of the response to the October attack into a more aggressive operation against the Arab population. He either scores the widespread support within Israel for such actions, cautioning against assumptions that leadership changes will alter this dynamic. Moving to recent diplomatic developments, he notes Turkish President Erdogan's significant visit to Egypt after 13 years, aimed at reconciling with President Sisi. He outlines the economic and political challenges facing Sisi and the implications of their discussions, particularly regarding Gaza and regional security concerns. Predicting potential regional unrest over the Gaza situation, he anticipates increased activism from Arab nations, potentially directed against Israel and its perceived backers, including the United States. He speculates on the possibility of an Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon and its broader implications, emphasizing Netanyahu's belief in his strategic advantage through U.S. support. He emphasizes that as long as Iran feels assured of support from its allies, particularly Russia, it feels emboldened to confront other regional adversaries. He underscores the complexity of engaging Iran, noting past instances where the U.S. avoided conflict despite provocations. He highlights the importance of considering the consequences of military action, 
pointing out the current state of military readiness compared to previous years. When transitioning to the situation in the Middle East, he discusses the limitations of relying solely on air and naval power and the potential challenges posed by emerging air defense technologies. He draws parallels to historical losses in warfare and warns against underest the potential losses in a conflict with Iran and other regional actors. He cautions against assuming stability in the absence of immediate conflict, suggesting that tensions could escalate over time. Reflecting on historical context, he notes differences in alliances and readiness compared to past conflicts, indicating that the current situation in the Middle East is not as precariously balanced as pre-World War I Europe. He observes a growing demand among regional populations for action against Israel and the United States suggesting a potential shift towards more aggressive stances. He points out the uncertainties leading up to November, particularly regarding potential fiscal crises. He highlights the mounting national debt and questions the sustainability of current spending levels, noting a lack of willingness to address the issue by cutting expenditures. He suggests that a banking crisis could be looming, exacerbated by factors such as a large influx of undocumented immigrants and rising criminality. Reflecting on historical context, he compares the current economic landscape to the Depression era, highlighting differences in workforce composition and manufacturing capacity. He raises concerns about the strain on resources caused by an unsustainable population and its implications for social services and public safety. Transitioning to global events, he discusses the possibility of unforeseen external factors, such as conflicts in Europe or the Middle East, disrupting supply chains and exacerbating existing fragilities. He observes signs of instability in the bond market and expresses apprehension about the potential for a collapse akin to a house of cards. In summary, he portrays a precarious economic and geopolitical situation with multiple potential triggers for crisis, underscoring the fragility of the current system. He begins by clarifying the number of undocumented immigrants in the United States, citing estimates from sources within Homeland Security. He expresses disdain for the current administration, alleging efforts to undermine national security. Reflecting on historical immigration policies, he discusses past concerns about the quality of immigrants and the impact of demographic shifts on American society. He traces the evolution of immigration laws, highlighting the significant changes initiated by Senators Javits and Kennedy in 1965. He criticizes Reagan's amnesty program, arguing that it exacerbated immigration issues rather than resolving them. He accuses current policymakers of following a similar approach, which he believes will only worsen the situation. Discussing the motives behind current immigration policies, he suggests that some in Washington view demographic shifts as a means of maintaining political power through division. He warns of the consequences of unchecked immigration, including social unrest and economic strain, particularly as resources become scarcer. He paints a grim picture of the current state of affairs, citing examples of economic hardship and rising criminality. He attributes these problems to both domestic mismanagement and external events, foreseeing further challenges ahead if current trends continue unchecked. He discusses concerns about election integrity, drawing from his experience growing up in a major city like Philadelphia. He suggests that in large urban areas dominated by one political party such as Chicago, New York City, Philadelphia, and Los Angeles, the electoral process may lack integrity due to entrenched partisan control and patronage systems. Expressing skepticism about the upcoming election, he questions the reliability of online voting, absentee ballots, and voter rolls containing outdated information. He warns a potential discontent if the election results do not reflect expectations for change, especially considering lingering doubts about the honesty of previous elections. Reflecting on the political landscape in Pennsylvania, he notes the stark divide between urban areas like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, which tend to lean left, and the rest of the state, which often supports conservative candidates. He speculates on the potential impact of the state's sizable veteran population on the election outcome, highlighting the importance of voter turnout in determining the final result. 